First of all, hello Lucerne and Tallinn. Thank you very much for having us. We are here on behalf of Pink Cloud and we are very interested to be part, part of these lectures, the discourse and to learn about the different approaches about naked space. So when we started to think about what were we going to present here because we were invited to talk about pop-up cities, we played a little with the theme and then we came up with the idea of a hermit crab strategy. So why a hermit crab? I mean, first of all, a hermit crab itself is a naked animal and what it does is it kind of looks for a shell which is a naked space and then the two of them kind of have a symbiotic combination so they basically are like the shell gets uh, to be a shelter and the crab reuses the shell in a, in a smart way. And the interesting thing is that um, there's like potential for growth. So the crab, like whenever the crab grows, they, um, it can find and use and adapt to new shells. And these shells not necessarily have to be shells, but they can like all kind of different objects that um, the cloud, uh, the cloud, the uh, crab can be in. And the next question might be why we call ourselves pinkcloud.dk. Um, so why do we talk about crabs? Why are we called Pink Cloud and why the .dk? So first of all, none of us is a Dane or Danish. So we are from different backgrounds, from different cultures. We have different education uh, locations and time zones. So you see that actually .ca, .de, .com and .eu wouldn't make sense because it wouldn't fit with all of us. And um, basically we try to be not based in the field of architecture, even though we are architects by education, but we um, see ourselves as creatives or if somebody asks what we are doing, we sometimes refer to be like professional experts, which is kind of flirting with the terminology and like kind of shifting and blurring the boundaries between uh, the different fields and domains because we believe that like this intersection is where like interesting stuff could happen. So the decay is there because we met in Copenhagen when we were interning for Henning Larsen Architects, which is like a big um, Danish firm. And we started our first competitions as side projects while we were interning there. So actually the first term crab strategy that we were using is actually like kind of using the infrastructure of that office and like using their facilities to push our own ideas and our own projects as like side strategies. And since it was like a temporary thing, I mean, everybody knows if you're interning, then you're going to be there for like six, seven, eight, maybe nine months. And then we have to go back and relocate and go back home. So we wanted to stay a collective and we wanted to stay connected. And um, I mean, Leon and I didn't meet in five years. Like this is like I met him yesterday in person, like after five years. Uh, Fabian never met Leon. Um, Eric and I met like also five years ago, Eric and Leon meet like once every year. So it's kind of, kind of interesting that we use the internet to stay connected and work since then. So this is why we got this idea of like calling ourselves cloud because we are more like, in, like a network and an institution that kind of collectively networks and does like cloud-based work. And um, the interesting thing about clouds is they kind of like transform and shape shift. They go cross borders, cross time zones. So they ignore a lot of these boundaries that like other objects would not. So how do we work? Um, usually it starts with like an idea and a discussion that spreads and like everybody has like their own kind of networks, local networks. So we are not only the four of us, but also like from different projects, we have like different partners that we like hop on and hop off. So we are kind of like a fluent system with um, many authors and we are sometimes just like kind of curating the process of getting ideas. So this is a bit how like usually architecture works, like you have a client that writes a brief, which is like a task that kind of circles the problem. And your job is to design a building and that is like the solution. That's what like most of the time is called architecture. And what we think is kind of boring is that the client already knows what he or she wants, which is a building. So our idea is like we sometimes start with a client in a brief, sometimes with an idea, sometimes with a thought, a joke or a cross reference, and basically an observation as a starting point. And then we try to circle the problem by researching and analyzing the conditions to actually go back and find the cause why we had this initial idea or why the client has this initial uh, brief. And then we try to develop strategies that might be design, text, a plan of action, a framework, or a building. 
and they are all basically tools uh, for communication. So this is more or less what we call architecture, what we would say is architecture. And we always try to circle like a global problem and find a local solution, but one that is like scalable. So we think more about architecture as a strategy to um, go into problems and like develop like a maybe global solution for it on a local um, idea. So what does this mean? Like, I'm, we're going to show you like um, three projects that we are working on or worked on or are currently working on. And the first one is um, a study and a commission. And it's going to be built in like 2018. And uh, to get you an idea about how this like from global to local to global should work in our approach, um, we started with Germany. And there's like a big discussion about rural versus urban. Um, so a lot of people are moving into cities, which means is there rural, uh, rural decay is like, uh, as you can see in the graphic, like there's wherever there's like a city center, it's dark blue and there's like a lot of people like moving in this area and the yellow is basically where there's um, people leaving. And this is like a typical German uh, village. It's in uh, northern Germany. And if you analyze the village, you actually see that there's like the old core village with the farms, marketplaces and shops. And then there's like some kind of um, newly built um, young village, which is um, kind of like a um, uh, rural sprawl, like a growing village. And at the same time, the old people stay within the um, older village center. And there's like a lot of unused or underused structures, especially these kind of decaying barns. <coughs> So these are like some examples that you can find everywhere in Germany. Um, you have these barns that are not used or underused. Um, they are a bit different from the up topologies that we saw earlier today. Um, they have a wooden framework and bricks, but the same thing applies. They are underused and it's basically like a rural void. So what happened like the farmer use was usually a barn for animals or storage for goods. And now it's mainly garages, dump for stuff, and it's a decaying structure. So we asked, like, could the future use like a reactivation, redensification of the um, village, and could there be like a transformation towards living? Because what we have, like, if we take a zoom in, um, we have usually like one house and like at least one barn that is like next to it, and it's like a big potential to like redensify villages. And the commission is actually here. This is like the site. This is the barn on the site. And it's actually in quite good condition. So um, right now it's used as a garage. And of course, there's a, like, a lot of stuff that is in there. But what we propose is like stripping the thing kind of naked, keeping the shell, inserting a box with the core functions in the ground floor, and basically having like an open floor plan on the ground floor for a family of four. And on the upper level, we have like a bathroom, sleeping, voids to see the lower floors and um, actually trying to not only preserve the, the shell, but also the structural elements to keep them visible inside. To, so we have like this dialogue of the new additions and the new use. And um, we try to update the uh, typology by preserving the history of the building. So what we want to do is actually like update old villages like as a, as a core concept why we are doing this. So we want to inject younger families into these like slowly dying and slowly older, older um, villages. So we have like a multi-generation diversity, which improves the quality of living for every member of these uh, villages. And this is not only a German problem, but the European Environmental Agency claims that Europe is um, one of the most intensively used continents on the globe, up to 80% used for settlement, production systems, and infrastructure. And they say that about land use. So this is kind of a similar map, yellow and blue again for the cities and course. So it's a similar picture in the whole of Europe. And um, they continue, like the um, European Environmental Agency claims that there's an increasing demand for living space per person, which causes a sprawl and like a cancerous growth of uh, land use and since land is a finite re, uh, resource, how it is used constitutes one of the principal reasons for environmental change with significant impacts on quality of life and ecosystems. 
So we have to find strategies to find to densify existing structures, otherwise we have a, a sustainability problem in a much different way than just insulation. All right, hello. Um, uh, now for uh, another example of uh, hermit crab strategy. This one is a little bit different. It's larger scale, also of a uh, different temporality. <clears throat> In 2011, we entered a competition that was hosted by Dow Chemical um, for uh, to design an energy zero housing. Um, but Dow obviously produces chemical and oil products. And um, the, the, the brief was to design an energy zero um, community, uh, not, an, uh, not just a simply a uh, sustainable one. Um, and when we started the competition, thinking about Dow, um, you know, we're in 2011, um, there was a kind of a global peak oil crisis happening at that time. Um, and um, a lot of experts believe that at some point uh, the supply of uh, petroleum would, would uh, continue to decrease. So we thought, is it possible for us to leverage this kind of opportunity of, uh, of a kind of uh, dramatically changing global oil landscape as a starting point to fundamentally question the brief of um, an energy zero house? Um, what if it's, it's not a house, but um, it's, it's a revitalization of some sort of oil refinery site into actual communities. Uh, the site we uh, looked at was um, at uh, Detroit. This is in the Rouge River area. You can see the clusters of oil storage vessels situated near the mouth of the river. Um, and, and to kind of to start the, um, the kind of proposal first, you have to uh, obviously decontaminate the site and, 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 and disassemble the silos for cleaning. But simultaneously, there would be a factory uh, prefabrication of components that would later be added to um, the silo when, when, when they both come together to be reconstructed. And so the goal, the primary goal is to first reduce um, the embodied energy in construction. So by, you know, not building a completely new structure, we're achieving that, but also we want to reduce energy demand of the future community as, uh, as much as possible, but also generate a maximum of energy based on the infrastructure available. So we looked at the, the, the structure itself. How can we take advantage of the existing structure? Um, we wanted to ev exploit every inch of the structure to make it not only suitable for living, but um, it also offers a very generous uh, living environment to the people. Uh, we proposed to add a secondary skin with insulation, cladding, and energy capturing device to kind of um, the up the energy um, uh, opt optimization level to exceed current limits. Um, but um, also, although Dow makes insulation, uh, the more sustainable option was actually to use uh, something we found called uh, like a, bi a biodegradable mushroom uh, derived insulation. Since the entire stru uh, structure is actually structural, um, the new systems could be directly integrated into the core of the structure, into the slabs, into the, um, the shells. Um, there's a new water cycle, a renewable energy system and storage, and also uh, a waste management uh, system. The fire stairs remain as primary access between the neighbors. Uh, we added some balconies. And we thought, um, you know, maybe we could actually split the, the unit into three different types of units. A, a small loft for a family of three, a two-story apartment for a family of four, a nuclear family, and also reserve the, the top floor for a multi-generation family of six. Here you can see the, um, the top floor plan and uh, the kind of generous uh, interior um, arrangement. The circular living spaces, high ceiling. The, the oil silo home would act as sort of a seed for a new community because of its high performing um, energy um, uh, kind of production. Um, this is a night view and you can see some of the other secondary amenities that would be tethered along the silo, charging station, water retention pond, etc. We also developed some sort of energy sharing ecosystem for the entire community. So what remains is, is, is the kind of vision of a new community while the exterior of the silo home is somewhat of a Frankenstein, 
it's, it's interesting that it registers um, both a new relationship with energy while acknowledging a much more volatile and kind of unpredictable past. Uh, Detroit was a test bed for us, but there are actually 49,000 uh, oil silo structures worldwide. And as the world population ra rapidly, rapidly grows, um, in total, with uh, existing silos and, and refinery sites, these communities can actually house half the population of Paris. Yeah, so another hermit crab strategy, and the reason why we initially got invited was the idea for the uh, pop-up hotel. So what is a pop-up hotel? It actually consists of three main ideas. The one is to solve a problem, to exploit existing infrastructure, as we've seen in the two projects before, and it should be a highly adaptable design. And how can we exploit the recession? Because back then in 2011, when we entered this kind of idea competition, um, the vacancy rate in Midtown Manhattan, which you can see in this picture here, was an average 21.6%, which means like some buildings were completely empty, some were just like partly used, and there's um, a lot of like type C office buildings at this time that were kind of um, decaying and like just like urban voids. So the problem was that this kind of um, vacancy rate was going on for like four years now. And we were thinking like, why should we waste the space that is like clearly like in a, in a very interesting position within um, Manhattan. So we thought about opportunities how to actually kind of activate this space. and. Uh, if you look into tourism in New York, you have like a steady growth that constantly uh, goes up. In 2011, we had like uh, 50.9 million people visiting New York. Um, I looked up yesterday, we have like 60.3 by now, so it's like an ever-growing field of uh, opportunity. So if we combine the problem that we circled with the opportunity that we found, we basically came up with the idea of like a pop-up hotel um, to um, have a, an interesting future for these sites. So how would it work? Um, for the setup, of course, we need, first of all, some kind of um, empty office building structure that is already there, and then ship our invention to the site, and then like actually like activate the site and have a pop-up hotel. So how does it work? Um, we developed some kind of sushi menu of like different um, typologies that you could order and like arrange and rearrange within the hotel. So there's like hotel functions, like uh, the lounge and the con concierge or a nap area. There's dining, there's uh, entertainment and amenities like uh, a sauna and learning and stuff like that. So basically with this menu, you could like furnish your hotel according to your needs or according to what you think is uh, interesting for, for the certain building. And to get this whole stuff inside the building, we thought like, how can we make this very efficient? So the base design is actually like a box, which is based on a US palette dimension, uh, as you can see on the, on the left. And we took the height of a elevator door, so this can be shipped in the building easily. So we have a resulting box size, and these boxes fit on a, a delivery truck you can have like 36 of these boxes on it, so it's quite efficient. And um, we took the idea a bit further and saw, thought like, based on the menu, these boxes could be color coded and there could be an ID sticker so everybody knows which box has to go in which floor and like how you can set up this whole thing. So as a result, you would have like a colorful truck running through Manhattan which is cl clearly like a, an interesting marketing tool as well because you see there's like some kind of uh, uh, stuff going on and you may wonder what it is and um, what's in the box like we try to fit in as much as possible so um, we have like developed like eight basic beds that you can unfold um, within one box you could also have like two sofas or four chairs and also like we were looking into like bathroom equipment like uh, two sinks two toilets a shower and a bathtub if you flip it like 90 degrees and also like partitions to like split the space so you could have like walls and wall dividers that uh, you can use in a flexible way to like adopt them to your um, floor plan. So there's another uh, setup shot and the existing conditions of these 
buildings looked like this. I mean, it was like office space. You have the core in the center. You have like a usually like a floor to ceiling glass facade. And we were trying to like make a case study to kind of communicate our, our strategy. So to start the tour, we would enter in the ground floor and set up like a, like a reception and lounge with uh, shops and fun additions. And this is just like to, to show that the system basically works. It's not meant to be like, this is the floor plan and this is the element that you have to use. But as we said before, it's like a, like a menu and you could like easily transform a regular office building into like a, like a hotel lounge because the infrastructure is already there more or less. Um, on a higher floor, you could have an event space with a bar, a lounge, or a library. You could do exercises and yoga, and you could even have like an inflatable pool if you want like some swimming idea. So we kind of tried to push this with these images of like these weirdly um, landscapes of like office buildings and some um, I don't know, like juxtaposition and injection of like weird typologies. And on other floors, you could have accommodation, so you could have bunk beds for backpackers and shared bathrooms, but you could also have like mid-class rooms with private bathrooms and social areas. And you could easily, as I said before, like mix the whole program, so you could have like a boxing ring on the one side and like bunk beds and like backpackers sitting and uh, sleeping on the other side. Um, but also we, you could have like some kind of deluxe rooms. I mean, of course, it's gonna be a different experience from deluxe rooms in like uh, Four Seasons hotels, but we were trying to, to develop like a radical idea for like certain people in, in a big city that might be interesting. So this is like almost the standard of a hotel room that, or a luxury hotel room that you might know, of course, like the walls are not the same uh, soundproofness, but since it's like a unique experience, like living in the middle of Midtown and like having all these office towers around you that might like excuse some more noises from your neighbors. So you could also just have like event-based um, hotel programs like a restaurant and a jazz bar or a cinema or a stage. So you could host like catwalks and like fashion shows and whatever. And one of the big opportunities that we saw is that it usually takes like four years to plan and realize a regular hotel which is like kind of ambitious if you even do like the construction. And with the system that we proposed, um, it's more like a movie set that you plan, like you do a lot of planning and then you have like a fast setup and it's like um, very scalable. Um, the project was presented in Las Vegas at a hospitality conference and we received first prize. Um, and we were approached to continue the project. Um, again, uh, in 2011, 16.7% of the average vacancy rate in um, most U.S. cities, um, uh, and, and this, you know the, the numbers go up as well. Um, certain major cities have much higher vacancies, um, not only Manhattan, Midtown. Um, so we, we slowly learned that you know this, this strategy uh, might be scalable to not only urban centers. And as luck would have it, uh, we were approached with an empty warehouse located in outside of uh, New York City, out in the, um, in the outer boroughs, there is an 80% uh, hotel occupancy rate. So tourism is also, is also thriving in that area. The so-called um, uh, outer boroughs are, uh, you know, downtown Brooklyn, Williamsburg in particular. So we looked at this building in South Bronx uh, with a new site. We have new challenges and also new opportunities. It was a garment factory. Uh, the building was in very good condition. We just simply need to kind of fill the interior deep large floor plates um, for very kind of um, dynamic program mixes. There's a lot of light around the edges and also the, the neighborhood itself is sort of like downtown Brooklyn except maybe five years, five years ago. Um, so this was Pop-Up Hotel One, short term cycle, modular pods. With Pop-Up Hotel uh, version two, um, the experience is also similar, but uh, longer leases due to owner preferences. And also because it's, it's, it's a warehouse, we're gonna propose uh, more typical construction. Um, of all the tourists, uh, 6.7 million of them are millennials. And for, and for this particular site, they are definitely the primary audience. Aside from location, um, they are really interested in good experiences and particularly shared experiences, not exclusive private uh, events. So for this one, uh, the project is still under development, um, but think more like an urban resort, longer stay, longer residences. Um, 
And the floor plate is huge. We could combine almost three floors of program onto one floor of the warehouse. With much higher ceiling and larger spaces, the warehouse allows for a much larger number of programmatic combinations. And uh, we're very excited to continue to develop this warehouse party. Same space could be a seasonal gallery, rooftop temporary receptions, um, and spaces for collective learning. Um, workshops on the very top floor actually have, they can use these skylights. Um, so the pop-up hotel is a strategy that learns from its context and also embraces its shell, whatever building it kind of nests itself into. Um, and this framework is, is it, propose, it proposes a kind of uniquely different hospitality experience from, from one building to another. So we just showed like three narratives of uh, hermit crab strategies in uh, three different uh, locations in, with like three different timelines and three different speeds. And um, what we want to like say that actually all of this is kind of like experimental and we try to like find a way to how to work in the 21st century as an architecture office or collective and um, how to address problems of our time. And uh, it's actually sometimes not that sure if we are using the hermit crab strategy or the um, Hermit Crab is like using us, I'm not really sure. Um, but one would be naked without the other. So we think these strategies could be conversation starters and like building them is kind of optional because um, maybe it's about seeing the potentials and we think this course is very important, especially in our field. So sometimes we are the crab, sometimes we are the cloud. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.